Welcome to another edition of Windsor Teaches Ancient History. This episode is going to be all about the life and reign of Servius Tullius the Sixth King of Rome, who fits into the Etruscan era between Tarquinius Priscus and Tarquinius Superbus. First of all, it's worth noting that Servius Tullius is the adoptive son of Tarquinius Priscus. We're to imagine they entered the house of Priscus during one of Priscus's Latin campaigns. When Romans conquered a city, they tended to take uh, children and women as slaves. And so this is how we think uh, Servius Tullius ended up in the household of Priscus, being raised as a slave, then taken under the wing of Tarquinius Priscus and his wife Tanaquil after a certain event in his childhood. That certain event was supposedly while the boy was sleeping, a flame licked around the top of his head for uh, a substantial amount of time, but leaving him totally unharmed. Priscus's wife, Tanaquil, uh, is an Etruscan and she's very adept at reading omens. One example we have of this before this instance is on her journey with Tarquinius Priscus to Rome. While they're riding their wagon from Etruria to Rome, an eagle swoops down and plucks the cap off Priscus's head. The eagle circles around the countryside and duly places it gingerly back on top of Priscus's head. Tanaquil interprets this as Priscus meaning that he is destined for greatness. And as a result, she is well qualified to step in at this point and say that this young boy, Servius Tullius, is destined for greatness as well. One has to wonder, however, how much this situation is open to manipulation. The fact that Tanakul is well qualified means that she can come up with anything that furthers her family's political aims and not bat an eye. It's probably also worth noting at this point that the era of Etruscan kings starting with Priscus has almost no, has zero legitimacy to the Roman throne. Priscus originally comes to Rome as an Etruscan who was an outsider in his home society of Etruria because his father was a man named Demaratus from Corinth. And so he was an outsider in Etruria and he comes to Rome still as an outsider looking for political gain. Dionysius tells us that Priscus was a benefactor of Rome, and it's very easy to take that viewpoint. He began building the Circus Maximus, he built the Cloaca Maxima. The, fir the former is for entertainment, keep the masses and plebeians happy, and the latter is a sewage system that would, in would have increased the hygiene of Rome and therefore the life expectancy of the Roman populace. However, you could take the more cynical view that Priscus was performing these actions on behalf of the plebeians and the lower down in terms of those of lower status in Roman society in order to borrow that legitimacy that he was so lacking from himself when he gained the throne of Rome. In fact, even while gaining the throne of Rome, he gets the reputation as a bit of a trickster. He sends away the sons of the previous king on a hunting trip, the previous king was called Ancus Marcius. In their absence, he sweet-talks the Senate, he sweet-talks the people, and he gets himself elected to the throne. Upon Mark Ancus Marcus's son's return, they are suitably irate that Priscus has finagled them out of the Roman throne, and they hire two shepherds. They ask the two shepherds to have a fake argument in front of Priscus, asking for his opinion on how to solve the dispute. While Priscus is distracted with one of the shepherds, the other one buries an axe in his skull. All the while, Tanaquil all the while, Tanaquil covers the death of Tarquinius Priscus, keeping him in bed and making the plebeians and the people of Rome believe that he is alive. All the while, she manoeuvres her adoptive son, Servius Tullius, onto the throne. So while Priscus has shaky claim to the Roman throne, Servius Tullius, born into slavery, into the royal household, has zero claim to the throne as well. We can largely see that this is a pattern in Rome that begins here, where it merges from an elected monarchy into a dynastic monarchy. Despite how Servius Tullius is not the full-blooded son of Tarquinius Priscus, he is his named heir and his adoptive son. A lot of commentators will say that this is a downturn for Rome. In not being elected by the people of Rome, they have lost the faith of the people. And actually, as a result, a lot of the king's actions become a lot more dastardly as time goes on. Tarquinius Priscus gets the name as a bit of a trickster. Servius Tullius of low birth tends to do quite a lot for the people in terms of social reforms. But of course, we end the story of Rome's monarchy with the dastardly 
Tarquinius Superbus. I think on some level there must be some sort of self-awareness from Servius Tullius that he has a distinct lack of legitimacy to the throne. The last elected king was Ancus Marcius, and Priscus, having earned the ear of Ancus Marcius, manoeuvres himself into the position of king in Ancus Marcius's son's absence. Not only that, but his adoptive mother, Tanaquil, has manoeuvred him, Servius Tullius, onto the throne at the death of Tarquinius Priscus. Not only that, but he's of low birth. He was born a slave in a Latin colony and brought to Rome. And so he has very, very little claim to the throne. And on some level, I believe he knows this. And so his two daughters, both called Tullia, according to the Roman tradition, he has them married to Priscus's two sons, who are Superbus, the older, and Aaron's the younger brother, and he marries them according to their age, the older Tullia to Superbus, and the younger Tullia to Aaron's. Of course, however, later on in the story, Tullia Major, the older Tullia, and the younger Tarquin are found to be lacking in terms of their ambition, and they are eventually bumped off, and Tullia Minor and Tarquin Superbus end up getting married. This is the same younger daughter that ends up running over her father after he has been thrown out of the Senate House in a chariot. However, Servius Tillis does put in place some very promising reforms during his reign. First of all, he implements a census, which is a document that notes down the assets of each individual Roman in the city. This becomes very useful for taxation purposes. The monarchy can see how much tax to reasonably charge each citizen of Rome. He also puts in place the Comitia Centuriata, which is a body of citizens that tries to give a voice to the normal working class plebeians of Rome. Furthermore, he also extends the vote to the plebeians as well. However, Dionysius indicates that Servius has been deceptive in the way that he does this. First of all, the plebs are grouped into uh, massive groups, and each massive group only receives one vote. The patricians could still outvote the plebeians as they were called first to the ballot box. This effectively meant that by the time the plebeians were called to the ballot box, they could already effectively have lost the vote. Of course, depending on the sort of ancient historian we are, we could view some of these events with cynicism. We know that his adoptive father got his name as a bit of a trickster and someone who had a silver tongue and could convince others of what he wanted. It's possible that Servius Tullius learned some of these tricks from his adoptive father. For instance, the census could be a cynical manipulation to figure out how to gut the Roman plebeians for as much tax money as was possible. Also, it meant that the monarchy could gauge effectively how many men were fit for the army. In founding the Comitia Centuriata, he gets the plebeians and the working class people of Rome on his side, which is a similar ploy to what Priscus does upon his ascension to the throne in order to borrow legitimacy in promoting 100 patricians of lesser families. We could easily, on the other hand, however, view Priscus and Servius as genuinely good guys who want to make a difference in Rome. Servius Tullius was of low birth and was born a slave, and so some people might like to think that he's doing these because he, know, he knows what it's like to be of low birth. We could easily argue the same for Priscus. Being an outsider to Rome, he might want to legitimately make those sort of decisions to make their lives better for normal working class Romans. However, as just described, we can spin this to the more cynical side as well. So what changes and what stays the same between the reign of Servius Tullius and the reign of the previous kings? Well, for continuity, there's a continuing trend of dynastic or inherited monarchy. Priscus gains his seat through trickery, and from that point onwards, the subsequent kings inherit the throne rather than are voted in. Rome is continuing to be ruled by foreign kings. From Priscus up to Superbus, they are Etruscan kings. Uh, they are classified as so despite the fact that we think Servius Tullius was Latin by heritage, despite that he's been brought up in an Etruscan home. The disproportional influence of Tanaquil in the events of Rome's monarchy. How far is she involved? Was, was Priscus suitably buoyed by her interpretation of the eagle omen to go on to greatness within the city of Rome? Would Servius Tullius have risen to prominence on the throne of Rome without her political manoeuvring and her essentially placing him onto that throne while Priscus was dying? There's some some continuation of social policies that benefit the people. We could say in the reign of Tarquinius Priscus, the Circus Maximus and the Cloaca Maxima are both social policies that benefit the people. 
However, on the other side of that, you could approach to both of those things with cynicism and say that if the government provides bread and circus for the plebeians, they're much, much less likely to rebel. So there's some elements of change and social change in Servius Tullius's career. So Rome is now ruled by someone of low birth, and you could easily say that that low birth is what motivates Servius Tullius to put in place some of the things that he did. So some changes are put into place for the plebeians and their political standing in the city. For instance, the census is the first of its kind. It shows real promise to approaching reasonable taxation levels for the plebeians. Also, the Comitia Centuriata, a body of citizens designed to give the plebeians a voice in the political dealings of the city. You can say there's some progress towards equality with some caveats. How far was the creation of the Comitia Centuriata a cynical ploy to gain favour of the plebeians? You could say the same for Priscus as well with the Cloaca Maxima and the Circus Maximus and the election of the hundred patricians of lesser families in Priscus's rule. I would encourage you to make up your own mind about Servius Tullius. Do not allow your own perception of him to be tainted by my particular viewpoint. Look at the events and then look at which interpretation you like best and how you can evidence that interpretation. Certainly some good social changes did come into place with Servius Tullius's reign, but you can think about how much of that is a continuation of previous kings and how much of that is novel to Servius Tullius and his reign in isolation from the other kings. That's it for another episode of Windsor Teachers Ancient History. Thank you very much for watching and listening.